Hello, everyone, and welcome to yet another webinar organized by ANT Neuro. My name is Farnoosh. I'm the head of education at ANT, and today I'm honored to be hosting the webinar on local regulation of sleep and wakefulness in the human brain implications and applications. Uh, this webinar will be presented by Dr. Giulio Bernardi, who is an associate professor in general psychology at the IMT School for Advanced Studies, Luca, in Italy. He obtained a PhD in neuroscience at the University of Pisa and worked in research centers in the United States and Switzerland. His current research activity focuses on the study of the reciprocal interactions between wakefulness and sleep, investigating in particular how sleep is influenced and in turn influences cognitive efficiency, learning, memory, and emotional regulation. In 2020, he obtained an ERC starting grant for a project aimed at exploring new methods for the non-invasive modulation of sleep and dreams. After this interesting presentation, we'll watch a relevant demo uh, video prepared by ANT Neuro Application Specialists. And in the course of the presentation, as always, you have the option to type your questions, which will be addressed uh, at the end of the session as far as the time allows. Also, you will see some poll questions uh, which require your attention and active participation to keep the session more interactive. So, Dr. Bernardi, once again, we do appreciate you accepting our invitation. And without further ado, we are looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I hope everyone can hear me and see the presentation, see the slides. I am uh, really happy to be here today and I'd like to thank uh, the organizers for the kind invitation to uh, this uh, webinar. So I would like to start my uh, presentation from uh, uh, definition. So we, uh, how can we define sleep in general? From behavioral perspective, sleep can be defined as a behavioral state uh, characterized by an immobile posture and by a diminished by readily reversible sensitivity to external stimuli. And in general, we uh, can identify individuals as being awake or asleep. Uh, so wake and sleep, the uh, wake and uh, uh, sleep have been considered for a long time as two mutually exclusive states. Um, however, we uh, typically do not rely only on a behavioral definition of sleep, but the gold standard approach for the study of sleep is uh, an electrophysiological one. In particular, we rely on three measures that are the electroencephalography or EEG, the electromyography, EMG, and the electroculography, EOG. And wh why we need three measures? Uh, actually, mostly because we need to identify a particular sleep stage, which is rapid eye movement sleep, uh, which is characterized by, as the name suggests, rapid eye movements and by muscle atonia. So that's why we need also EOG and EMG. And uh, the EEG of REM sleep is uh, similar to the one of relaxed wakefulness. Um, so we need these additional signals. Uh, however, this presentation will not discuss much uh, uh, about REM sleep. I will rather focus on uh, uh, no REM sleep, which represent about 70-75% uh, of our overnight sleep. Indeed, when we fall asleep, our EG signal uh, changes, and uh, we see that brain activity goes from a low amplitude high frequency activity to a high amplitude low frequency activity uh, during uh, uh, no REM sleep, as I said. And uh, from uh, uh, another perspective, we these uh, changes in brain activity are also known to be associated with changes in uh, uh, neuromodulators. So in particular, we see a reduction in uh, uh, activatory neuromodulators like acetylcholine and norepinephrine, for instance. And REM sleep in this perspective is again a sort of an exception. Uh, it's characterized by an increase in acetylcholine. However, so we see that uh, when we go from wakefulness to sleep, there are overall global changes in brain activity and uh, uh, neuromodulators, as we said. So here, I also, as a way to understand a bit uh, the, the knowledge that the, the, the attendant have of uh, sleep, 
in general and sleep regulation is the first poll which asks which of these are considered the main EEG hallmarks of norem sleep. The poll is ongoing and we'll give this five more seconds. So far, 80% of the participants voted. That's a good number, so let's close the poll and share the results. Can you see the results, Julio? Uh, not well, them. actually. So 77% uh, opted for the first um, option, the slow wave. Mm -hmm. um, then 14% the sleep spindle, uh, 6% uh, the sawtooth babe, and only 3% for gamma activity. I don't know if it's in line with what you expected. Yeah, that's in, perfectly in line. I was expecting some people responding actually the sleep spindle, which is the other main hallmark of non-REM sleep. However, um, I, at least in my opinion, they are clearly both important uh, signatures of northern sleep, but the uh, slow wave is uh, something that really um, uh, now mark that typically increase when we go from wakefulness to sleep, that we see an increase in the density and up with those slow waves and uh, is typically considered as the main signature of the deepest phase of northern sleep. Uh, so indeed, my focus will be on the uh, sleep slow wave, uh, which is a particular EG uh, correlate that is generated when neurons become bistable, uh, which means that they oscillate between two states, a state of hyperpolarization uh, in which neurons are silent, this is also indicated as off period, uh, and the state of depolarization uh, or on state in which neurons are active and fire. So the uh, synchronized uh, oscillation of neurons between these two states is what generates the, the slow wave that we record on the scalp EEG. And uh, here I must also apologize to uh, all uh, researchers that work in the uh, sleep field from the perspective on, uh, of uh, animal studies, as I will focus most of my presentation on, on human studies, as I want to give an overview uh, of how really um, local sleep regulation can be studied in humans. So there will be almost no uh, reference or very few references to study performed in animals. Um, so in humans, obviously, the the best uh, approach we can consider the best uh, for investigating the local regulation of sleep is the intracranial recording as this approach has the best special resolution uh, available. Uh, so intracran studies based on intracranial recordings, which however are typically performed in patients and mostly in uh, subjects with uh, epilepsy, uh, show that slow waves are not global events. So why we saw global changes in brain activity with this increase in low frequency high amplitude activity from wakefulness to sleep, actually the slow wave is not a global event, meaning that we can see it in some brain regions, but not in other at a given time. Uh, this also means that we can see uh, one region showing some uh, uh, off period, so off period with a slow wave, and another region may instead be active, showing a wake-like pattern of activity. So, now we have a different idea compared to what we had uh, uh, like more than 30, 40 years ago regarding wakefulness and sleep. Uh, we don't consider them anymore as two mutually exclusive states, but actually we know that there, there are sort of extrema of a spectrum in which uh, we can also have states uh, of uh, behavioral wakefulness in which uh, we also see highlands of sleep-like activity. Uh, on the other hand, we can have uh, uh, behavioral sleep uh, uh, with uh, uh, different regions showing different degrees of sleep depth, and even some uh, parts of the brain may be in a wake-like state uh, during sleep. How can we study these uh, local uh, aspects of sleep in a physiological condition? So we said that uh, intracranial recordings are uh, optimal for this, but they are typically performed in patients. Uh, so how can we do that in actually in physiological conditions? 
Um, EG is the gold standard for the study of sleep, but has a very bad special resolution compared, for example, to functional magnetic resonance imaging. Um, however, we can uh, rely on at least two solutions to improve, let's say, our special resolution. Uh, one is to use a high density EG with a 64 or up to 256 electrodes, which can be also combined with approaches for source modeling. Uh, which can allow us to reach a, a special resolution roughly comparable to the one of standard fMRI, so in the order of uh, millimeters. And uh, we can also uh, combine EEG and fMRI, so they can be co-recorded in the same individual, and then we can use events detected on the EEG signal to um, look for their fMRI correlates. This approach also has another advantage, which is the fact that fMRI can be used to explore uh, activity also in subcortical structures, which is most, mostly uh, not possible with EEG. So then, uh, however, we need to identify uh, our slow waves in the EEG signal, and this can be done in uh, two main uh, ways. Uh, one, one way to uh, evaluate slow waves is to actually look at the signal power in the delta range. Because slow waves, as we saw before, uh, typically have the maximum activity in the delta range between 0 0.5 and 4 hertz. So one uh, uh, way to evaluate slow waves is to look at slow wave, what is called also slow wave activity. I don't really like this term because it's actually just another way to call the delta power. But this is how delta power is commonly uh, actually in, in, in indicated in the sleep field. So I will use this term also in my presentation. Another way is to automatically detect slow waves with uh, automated algorithms. And, uh, and then we can identify single slow waves and uh, evaluate their characteristics, uh, like their duration, their amplitude, the slope, and so on. And so when we once we identify the slow waves, for example, we can use their timing to look at their correlates in the fMRI signal, for instance. So now I will give an overview of different uh, perspectives, different uh, approaches uh, that have been used to, to explore the local regulation of uh, slow waves uh, in particular, and uh, using uh, different approaches, as I said, including high density EG and also a combination of EG fMRI. Um, and I would like to start from uh, uh, brain maturation, what happened during brain maturation. And again, here we have, uh, uh, we start from a poll. So the, the question here is, uh, during development, how brain maturation occurs? So there are four options, and I would like to see your response here. All right, more than 70% of the participants have voted, so we close the poll and share the results. Um, interestingly, 55% voted for following the posterior to anterior gradient, and then 26% uh, roughly simultaneously across brain regions, and um, yeah, option two and four have almost the same vote, 11% and 8%. Okay. Thank you. And uh, well, for the most part, it seems the main gradient of uh, brain maturation is actually the posterior to anterior gradient. So it's uh, uh, answer C. And indeed, there are several studies that showed how, um, if we look at uh, uh, measures of uh, brain structure derived from MRI, including uh, gray matter volume, uh, cortical thickness, and also measures of white matter myelination uh, derived from uh, MRI signals, uh, we can see that uh, there is a gradient of maturation, a gradient of change uh, in the posterior to anterior direction across uh, childhood and adolescence until we reach the adult pattern uh, after adolescence. And interestingly, this pattern of maturation is also measured by uh, changes in, the, in terms of uh, behavioral and cognitive skills. So we see an acquisition of uh, uh, different skills uh, um, 
mirroring, as I said, the, the acquisition of changes in the brain structure. What is interesting from our perspective is that this kind of gradient is also observed for slow waves, for slow wave activity. So this study uh, by Salome Kurt showed that uh, uh, slow wave activity, the peak of slow wave activity is maximal in posterior regions in uh, early in childhood, and then moves more and more anteriorly across adolescence until adulthood. And then in adults, it reaches the maximum in the frontal regions that is typical for the slow wave activity. And uh, so this has been shown using a high density EG. And we recently uh, performed a, a similar investigation uh, in this direction, but using a combination of EEG fMRI. So we looked uh, at the fMRI correlates of sleep slow waves in both uh, school age children and adults. And we found that uh, the occurrence of slow wave is associated with uh, um, negative hemodynamic deflection in the fMRI signal uh, in, that shows uh, this maximum effect, especially around the somatomotor cortex. And this is true in both children and adults. So the somatomotor cortex seems to be relevant, uh, commonly associated to the occurrence of uh, slow waves. However, the effect extended more posteriorly in children involving in particular the parietal cortex, while it extended more anteriorly in adults involving the frontal regions. So our results are in line uh, with the EG fMRI and in line with previous observations based on the high density EG and indicate that local slow wave changes during development reflect regional brain maturation and the acquisition of uh, behavioral and cognitive skills. Now, another pers uh, perspective is uh, the one of uh, uh, that explores instead the relationship between uh, experience-dependent plasticity and slow waves. And here we have another poll. Does sleep affect learning? Okay, I'm sharing the results. And it seems there is 100 person consensus on option three. Sleep promotes the consolidation of new memories. Okay, that's good. At least this time we have the full consensus uh, for this answer, which is obviously the correct and the expected one. And yes, there is a tight relationship between sleep and learning, and uh, uh, as I will show now, also between local sleep and learning. So this is uh, the these are the results of a classical study performed by uh, Reto Uber at the time in Julio Tononi's lab, and this showed that after motor learning we can see an increase in slow wave activity that uh, is maxim, uh, has its maximum above, uh, uh, more or less, in a region corresponding to the somatomotor area. Uh, so there is a local increase in slow wave activity during, following, uh, after, during sleep after learning. And vice versa, if uh, uh, learning is prevented, so if uh, the use of this region, let's say, is uh, prevented through army mobilization, we see a decrease in slow wave activity, more or less, over the same region. And here he, he are the same uh, results, the same uh, analysis uh, using source modeling. So we source modeling confirmed that the effect was especially strong around uh, the somatomotor regions. Uh, even more interestingly, the same study showed the existence of a correlation between uh, the local changes in slow wave activity and the changes in performance. So, for instance, there, there, there was an association between uh, how much slow wave activity increased and uh, how much performance improved from before to after sleep. So, this uh, led also to hypothesize that uh, slow wave activity may not just track changes in uh, um, experience dependent plasticity, but also be directly related to. Uh, the, the, the function of sleep uh, in, uh, in memory consolidation and learning. Now, these kind of results have been replicated a few times for the motor system. And uh, however, we, uh, we were curious to know whether this can be extended also to other systems uh, in the brain. And so a few years ago, we tried a sort of a, an extension, a replication study, uh, but for the visual system. So we uh, basically replicated the army mobilization paradigm, this time, however, using a visual deprivation paradigm. So subjects uh, of this study came for two different sessions. In one case, 
they were visually deprived but with blindfolding for eight hours and they were requested to listen to audiobooks. And in the other case, in the control condition, they instead uh, watched movies for a similar amount of time. Then they went to sleep and they were recorded uh, with a high density EG system with 156 channels. And uh, then uh, we looked at the changes in uh, uh, the number of uh, slow waves uh, in the occipital region. And we found that, uh, as expected, there was a decrease uh, in the number of local slow waves uh, after visual deprivation compared to the visual stimulation, the control condition. And uh, interestingly, however, this effect appeared to be modulated by how much subjects relied on visual imagery. Indeed, we noted that some participants uh, said that they, they will use the youth visual imagery to, for example, uh, imagine to visualize uh, the, the content of the audiobooks they were listening to. So when we uh, analyzed separately subject that reported a high reliance on visual imagery as measured using a Likert scale from one to five. Uh, we saw that uh, uh, those with a high reliance of visual imagery actually had a very small effect or no effect at all in terms of changes in slow wave activity. And indeed, we also noted uh, a correlation uh, between changes in slow wave activity and reliance on visual imagery. And this correlation was especially strong uh, in the procedure uh, regions. And then with source modeling, we confirmed that the effect was uh, affecting in particular the uh, visual cortex. So apparently, uh, changes in visual experience uh, I mean, in line with the results obtained for the motor system affected slow wave activity in the occipital region. However, and interestingly, um, visual imagery compensated in part for the effects of uh, lack of visual experiences. And this is in line with what we know about visual imagery, which basically relies on the same uh, system, on the same regions that are activated uh, during uh, normal perception. So probably visual imagery uh, induced a sort of internally driven activation of the visual system and compensated for the lack of uh, visual stimulation. So overall, these results indicate that local slow wave changes reflect experience dependent regional activity and plasticity related to learning and memory. Now, another perspective is the one that links instead uh, local slow wave changes and conscious experience. And here we have the fourth poll uh, regarding dreams. So when do dream experiences occur? Uh, dream experience may be reported upon awakening from, and here again, I want to hear your responses. All right, we have almost 70% of the participants voted. So we close the poll and share the results. 56% uh, voted for all of the above, 42% for uh, REM sleep, 3% uh, for NREM sleep, and no one voted for the first option. Okay, thanks. And uh, indeed, it's more or less in line with what I expected. Uh, this depends a bit on the definition that we give to dreams. If we define dreams as any kind of conscious experience that we can have during sleep, uh, which is now a definition that is commonly used in the field, we actually uh, can say that we dream in all the sleep stages. So, uh, and we may just use different names, for example, in the falling asleep process, uh, we call them hypnagogic hallucinations, uh, but still uh, they are forms of conscious experiences that we have during sleep. They may be more or less rich, more or less vivid, and for sure the most vivid and rich experiences are those from REM sleep, but still we can have uh, experiences, uh, so dreams, in any sleep stages. Um, so now I want to show exactly how the slow waves relate to conscious experience, to dreams in general. Uh, this is a study that was uh, performed by Francesca Sicari uh, and colleagues in, uh, in Tononi's lab uh, a few years ago. And uh, in this study, uh, what happened is that participants were awakened every uh, 15, 20 minutes and asked whether they were dreaming. And they also reported that they, they answered some questions from a standard questionnaire regarding the characteristics of their uh, dreams or their experience. What you see here in this image is uh, 
a new program showing the different stages of sleep that were uh, in which the, the sleeper uh, was at different moments during the night. So the sleeper went from wakefulness uh, to N1 and two different stages of non-REM sleep. Then there is also REM sleep and so on. And each arrow indicates an awakening. So here you can see the subjects were awakened many, many times in order to collect data. The, um, this was uh, what is called a serial awakening paradigm, which was combined with a high density EG recording from the participants. So uh, upon awakening, uh, based on the report of the subject, the, re the, the, brain, the, the, the brain activity before the, the awakening was classified as associated with a dream report or not associated with a dream report. And uh, so we uh, basically compared the brain activity uh, related to dream reports versus activity in which the subject said that they had no conscious experience before the awakening. And the results show that uh, uh, when subjects reported a dream uh, upon awakening, they before the awakening, actually they had uh, uh, less slow wave activity overall. So less uh, slow waves and smaller slow waves typically. And with source modeling, uh, it was possible to show that uh, um, the, the changes in uh, the level of slow wave activity were especially relevant when they occurred in posterior regions. So uh, lower levels of slow wave activity in posterior regions were associated with a higher probability of reporting a dream upon awakening. And uh, interestingly, the same effect was also demonstrated for REM sleep. So here you see a, um, a, um, an overlap between the results obtained for non-REM sleep and REM sleep. And uh, the, the dark red regions are those representing the overlap. So it seems that dreaming relies on similar mechanism in the two, two sleep stages. So a sort of a partial awakening in a sense of these posterior regions. And uh, one may be surprised uh, regarding the, uh, the, this uh, possible presence of slow waves in REM sleep, but actually there have been several studies in animals and also in humans showing that uh, slow waves may also occur locally in REM sleep. And in this study that we published a few years ago, we show that uh, if we look at the delta range, we can identify at least uh, two types of delta waves in REM sleep. One is the sawtooth wave, which actually are waves that occur in burst uh, are a bit faster in terms of frequency. They are often associated with the eye movements and they also are associated with increases in eye frequency activity. So these are different from typical slow waves of northern sleep. But you can also have slow waves that instead are more similar to those of northern sleep that are not associated with eye movements and are instead associated with a decrease in high frequency activity similar to uh, slow waves of NORAM. And these waves are especially represented, uh, especially observed uh, in posterior brain regions. So also in REM sleep, we can have local slow waves, and this may probably affect the occurrence of uh, conscious experience. And also the same studies and other studies uh, that were uh, published in the following years show that the distribution of uh, slow waves uh, and the distribution of wake-like patterns in the brain were also related not only to the presence or absence of dreaming, but also to the content of dream. So that, for example, more wake-like activity in anterior regions was uh, uh, more often associated with thought-like dreams while wake-like activity in posterior regions was related to perceptual dreams. And then uh, uh, the partial awakening, let's say, of different regions uh, was related to different contents, like special setting, movement, fear, speech, faces, and so on. So in conclusion, local slow wave changes seems to be related to the emergence, but also to the content of conscious experience during sleep. The last aspect that I want to discuss is the relationship between local slow waves and uh, changes in behavior during wakefulness, and here, we also have our last poll. So can sleep like slow waves occur during wakefulness? All right, I think we can close the poll and uh, share the results. So 11% voted for the first one, not really. 49%, yes, they are relatively common. 23%, yes, but only after sleep deprivation. 17% yes, but only in pathological conditions. OK, 
Okay, and this is actually more or less in line uh, with, uh, uh, I mean, with what I expected, let's say. Um, indeed, uh, I will try to convince you that they are actually relatively common during wakefulness. Um, there is still some debate because we still have to demonstrate that are really these are similar in all aspects to slow waves that can occur during sleep, but uh, there are good reasons to think so. So let's go. And this is probably the only slide that I have regarding animal studies. This is a study by Vlad Gazowski who showed that during extended wakefulness, uh, rats can um, show uh, start to show off periods in uh, uh, small neural populations associated with uh, slow waves in the EEG signal. And he also showed that when uh, these uh, slow waves occurred in task related regions, for example, during a sugar pellet reaching task, uh, the animal was more prone to commit errors in the task. Uh, while instead, for example, if uh, the off period, if the slow wave occurred in a non task related region, uh, there were no changes in performance. So uh, this study actually suggested that uh, uh, when uh, uh, during extended wakefulness, when the probably neurons get sort of fatigued, though, they can start to show sleep-like activity, so slow wave-like activity. Then the next question was to whether this something like that could be also observed in humans. And uh, uh, this, is, this was the aim of this study published by uh, Bessie Young and Simone Sarasto, who started from uh, an assumption. So they assumed that uh, as much as we saw that uh, uh, slow waves increase locally in an experience dependent manner in task related regions, they may also be seen uh, increasing during wakefulness in the same regions that have been used intensively during the day. So they asked uh, a group of 16 participants to participate in two different experimental sessions. In one case, they listened to audiobooks for 24 hours. In the other case, they played with a driving simulation game for the same amount of time. And then they looked at the relative changes in uh, brain activity after 20 hours of wakefulness. Uh, the two tasks were selected because they were expected to require the involvement to involve different uh, brain networks, brain regions. And in line with this, they saw that after audiobook listening, uh, there was a stronger increase in low frequency activity over the frontal regions, while instead the increase was stronger over parietal regions after driving simulation. So this study suggested that these low frequency waves that increased uh, in, uh, in an experience dependent manner were reflecting the occurrence of uh, uh, sort of fatigue and plasticity related uh, uh, local slow waves in wakefulness. However, this study did not investigate the possible association between these waves and changes in behavior. And that's why we planned sort of a replication study in which, however, the audiobook listening task was replaced with an executive function battery in which the subject played with the several tasks requiring decision making and impulse control. And also the task that the the paradigm was modified to include every two hours a test session in which the subject completed a visual motor test requiring visual motor coordination uh, and rapid movements and uh, a response inhibition task in which the subject were presented with several stimuli uh, in rapid sequence and they had to respond to all the stimuli and withhold the response to some uh, targets. And with this study, we showed that uh, uh, when local low frequency waves were present in the, for example, parietal regions bilaterally, subject tended to be slower in the visual motor task. And uh, also that instead when uh, uh, slow waves were involved in the frontal region, subject were more uh, often committing uh, errors in the impulse control task. So this, the distribution of these waves was related to performance. When the waves affected task related regions, this had an impact on the, the subject's performance. And it's also interesting uh, that this study, the results of this study were obtained uh, not uh, with the, in the, within the window of sleep deprivation, but actually at 7 p.m., so during a, a waking period of normal length. And uh, based on these results, we hypothesized that actually these uh, low frequency waves, these uh, low uh, sleep-like waves could be observed also in relatively well-rested individuals. 
And uh, we also wanted to know if these waves could affect uh, socially relevant, let's say, functions, and not just uh, functions uh, that can be sort of simulated, uh, like impulse control in the, in the laboratory environment. So we did another experiment in which participants came for two different sessions again, and they were presented with a series of uh, funny video clips. Uh, and uh, during these uh, clips, the, the, during the, the watching of these clips, the EEG signal was recorded. And in one experimental condition, subjects were requested to suppress their emotional responses. So they were asked to not change their facial expression. And in the other case, instead, they were left free to uh, express their emotions. And the, the face of the subject was recorded uh, during the task. Then we measured uh, in a semi-automatic manner the occurrence of episodes associated with changes in facial expression. And as expected, we saw that indeed the number of uh, um, emotion suppression failures was relatively low in the uh, emotion suppression condition, but still some of the subjects had some emotion suppression failures. So meaning that they changed their, they did not resist to, to the video clips and they changed their facial expression, they laughed. And then we saw that uh, how many times the, these failures occurred was correlated with uh, how much sleep the subject had before uh, the night before the experiment. So uh, a smaller amount of sleep was correlated with a higher number of uh, emotion suppression failures. And we also saw that uh, these emotion suppression failures were specifically preceded by local increases in uh, um, slow wave activity. In particular, there were slow waves uh, occurring in the left parietal and frontal regions just before the moment subjects uh, uh, started laughing in the experiment. So it seems that these local slow waves can also occur uh, without any sleep deprivation involved and even without any kind of uh, uh, task specific fatigue involved. Another aspect that is worth mentioning regarding this uh, local slow wave in wakefulness uh, is that they can also affect uh, uh, subjective experience. This is a study uh, by Thomas Rion who showed that uh, uh, during a task, if a slow wave uh, occur in the frontal regions, subjects are more likely to enter into a mind-wandering state, uh, while instead if a slow waves affect posterior regions of the brain, uh, subjects are more likely to enter into a mind-blanking state in which they have uh, uh, no specific conscious experience uh, and they are sort of uh, uh, disconnected momentarily from the task they are doing. So, Overall, these results show that local slow waves during wakefulness are associated with changes in behavior and subjective experience. Now, what are the mechanisms that can explain uh, these changes in local slow waves in these different uh, conditions that I showed? There are different hypotheses. I want to focus at least on two of them. One idea is that uh, neurons that are activated during uh, wakefulness uh, accumulate uh, uh, sort of cellular stress, meaning that uh, this uh, continuous neural activity leads to the accumulation of metabolites, uh, may lead to some degree of uh, uh, damage uh, and energy deficits. And so at some point, the cell enters into a device stable state, into the sleep like state to protect itself from further damage. Uh, so to, to prevent further activation in a sense. And we can imagine that the more neurons become bistable, the more they will be able also to synchronize in the, and get uh, and lead to the generation of larger slow waves. So this may explain why we see uh, slow waves that, uh, um, that uh, increase in number and amplitude during extended wavefulness and with task practice, for instance. The other mechanism could be related to the so-called synaptic homeostasis hypothesis proposed by Cacciarelli with Giulio Tononi. They suggested that uh, during the wakefulness, uh, there is a prevalent synaptic strengthening so that, uh, uh, basically based also on the ambient rules, that neurons that fire together, wire together, we can have uh, uh, during learning and during uh, daily activities, let's say a prevalent strengthening of uh, synapses. This, however, will come with a cost in terms of energy, in terms of uh, occupied space. And so we will see a decrease 
in uh, synaptic strength during sleep. So one of the functions of sleep could be indeed uh, to renormalize synaptic strength in order to allow uh, learning the following day. And uh, these changes in connectivity may explain again in part the changes in uh, uh, slow waves that we observe because if you assume that neurons are bistable and strongly connected with each other, you can say, they may be able to synchronize more efficiently and so to produce larger slow waves. And instead, when during sleep, synaptic strength is reduced, uh, then also uh, the, the, the quality, the, the efficiency of synchronization will decrease, uh, leading to smaller slow waves. So this scheme sort of represents all these uh, uh, observations that we described. So we can imagine that when we wake up in the morning, neurons can fire at their full capacity, and there are very few or no, almost no episodes of local sleep in any brain regions. Then the more we stay awake, and the more we practice with specific tasks that require activation of uh, some uh, specific brain regions and networks, so we see an increase in uh, neural fatigue, we can say, and so an increase in local uh, slow waves. And then when we sleep, we also see an increase in uh, local uh, slow waves uh, of, of, of non-REM sleep. Then sleep uh, uh, reverts the change that occurred during wakefulness and so allow us to recover and allows our, new, our neurons to recover their maximal efficiency. Obviously, you're assuming that sleep is of sufficient length and quality to allow for this uh, uh, restorative function. So it seems that based on what I showed so up to now, that uh, the local regulation of sleep uh, um, is strongly related to both the subjective experience, conscious experience, and to plasticity, in a sense, can be even used as a readout uh, to tr or to track changes in uh, experience-dependent plasticity. And we also saw that it actually may be directly related with experience-dependent plasticity, so that uh, uh, slow waves may have a a specific function in uh, memory consolidation. So it may be interesting actually to understand if we could in some ways modulate slow waves overall, but even more importantly, locally within specific brain networks in order to modify and to, for example, potentiate plasticity within specific brain uh, networks and regions. And that's indeed the last part of my presentation. We said at the beginning that the waves are generated by this alternation between two different states, uh, the, the spontaneous alternation between hyperpolarization and depolarization. But actually, we know that the waves can be also uh, induced uh, by external stimuli. So we know that, for example, an analytory stimulus uh, can induce a brief period of activation that is followed by an hyperpolarization during sleep. So we can evoke what are called the K-complexes. But K-complexes, in a sense, are just uh, slow waves. Uh, so they have been shown to have the same characteristics of uh, uh, spontaneous slow waves. K-complexes, as I said, can be evoked. Some K-complexes can also occur as uh, spontaneously. These, however, are commonly thought to potentially represent uh, evoked K-complexes for which we cannot identify the the original stimulus, the, the source uh, of, uh, that generated the K-complex. What, what is important for us, however, is that K-complexes seems to uh, reflect the same uh, physiological changes as uh, spontaneous slow waves, with the difference that they are larger and more widespread. So they are associated with a higher slow wave activity. Uh, it has been observed that uh, the probability, uh, the effect of a sensory stimulus during sleep, however, change also depending on uh, uh, ongoing brain activity. So that, for example, if uh, I present an auditory stimulus during the up phase of a slow wave, so in the on state, I can indeed induce a K-complex. Uh, and so with this mechanism, I can also induce trains of uh, slow waves and increase my slow wave activity. If instead I play my sound uh, during, during the slow wave, so within uh, the, the, the period or the off period of the slow wave, I can uh, sort of interrupt the slow wave and maybe even uh, um, block the production of slow waves for a few seconds. And so these observations led to uh, the generation to the, the, the idea of uh, creating these closed loop uh, mechanisms, closed loop paradigms, 
in which uh, sleep is evaluated in real time and then based on the ongoing activity of, uh, so of ongoing slow waves uh, we can stimulate uh, during the on or the off period in order to enhance or suppress slow wave activity and this is the first study that employed this technique by Ingo and colleagues, and they show that uh, uh, by stimulating, uh, by detecting the ongoing slow wave and then stimulating during the on period, it's possible to induce trains of slow waves, so to increase slow wave activity, and this has a beneficial effect on memory performance, so we can probably enhance the, the, the effect of, uh, the, of slow waves on, on memory. Now there are different techniques that can be used to, uh, to create these closed loop algorithms. The main approaches are amplitude based or template based. The amplitude based approach uh, basically uh, assumes that the slow wave is, the, uh, is a big uh, negative wave and so can be uh, detected when the EG signal goes below a certain threshold. And uh, so in this case, uh, we we define, we are obviously to define an arbitrary threshold for the amplitude of the wave. Um, the template-based approach instead uh, assumes that the, it's based on the special distribution of the negative wave, uh, the, so on the topographic level. And uh, there is a, we, well, we compute a correlation between a specific template and the ongoing EG signal across all electrodes until we get a match. And so when the EG signal match the template, uh, we assume that the, what we detected is a slow wave. Both methods can be used to target local slow waves because we said that slow waves can occur in different moments in different regions. So we can target slow waves occurring in different regions. For example, the amplitude based method can be applied to slow waves detected on a specific electrode. And uh, the template based method can be uh, applied using different templates reflecting uh, the topography of slow waves involved in different brain regions. So we are moving toward a closed loop approach applied to specific brain uh, regions and networks. And uh, means that we can say that this is still a work in progress, but there are uh, very interesting preliminary results, and I will show just a couple of them. This is a study published a few years ago by a group of Reza Uber in Switzerland. He showed that if uh, after motor learning, we use this uh, closed loop paradigm to suppress slow wave activity in uh, task rated regions, so targeting uh, uh, an electrode above a task rated region, we can suppress the beneficial effects of sleep on memory, on, on learning, on motor learning. And also, a recent study that this is not yet peer reviewed, it's just a preprint, but still pretty interesting. Um, this study showed that if we increase locally slow wave activity over the posterior regions of the brain, we can uh, uh, reduce the probability for the subject to report a dream experience, which is in line with uh, what we saw or with, uh, before with the fact that. Uh, more uh, slow wave activity in posterior regions seems to be associated with a lower probability of reporting a dream upon awakening. So modifying uh, slow wave activity can also affect dreaming and maybe a similar approach could be used to modify also the content of dreams. So in conclusion, it's well pretty verified now that sleep and wakefulness are locally regulated and that uh, local aspects of sleep and wakefulness can be explored non-invasively in humans using combined EG fMRI or identity EG and source modeling. Slow wave activity, which is the main hallmark of non-REM sleep, can be modulated locally during non-REM sleep itself, but can be also observed during other states like REM sleep or wakefulness. And uh, also local changes in slow wave activity may be used as a readout of brain plastic structural changes and also to predict changes in subjective conscious experience. And finally, this is a, a, an avenue for new research that's just opened recently. Uh, slow waves can be modulated locally within, within selected temporal intervals, thus affecting regional efficacy of uh, sleep related functions. And with this, I conclude my presentation by thanking all the researchers and students in my lab, our collaborations and the funding agencies. And thank you for your attention.